All right, well, this morning we're going to talk about the biblical basis for physical healing, okay? And, uh, you know, uh, when we look at the life of Jesus and his ministry, physical healing was a central part of Jesus' ministry. He spent as much time praying for the sick and healing the sick as he did ministering and teaching and preaching. And not only did Jesus do this, but he modeled the ministry of physical healing to those who followed him. He commanded also that his apostles and his followers at that time were to disciple and equip future generations to do the same. So not only did Jesus teach his followers at that time by modeling and demonstrating uh, physical healing, his intention was that they would train the next generation. So you guys have a call to do the works that Jesus did, even at a young age. Um, and Scripture clearly teaches that physical healing is a central part of the gospel and that Jesus intended it to be a ministry that every believer practices throughout all the ages. I want to read a quote from a man named Dr. Randy Clark. And Dr. Clark um, is the founder of, and leader of an organization called Global Awakening. And he wrote, Deliverance and healing were just as prominent to the gospel as the actual proclamation of the gospel. So what does that mean? That means that in addition to just preaching, that the, the work of praying for the sick and releasing physical healing is, was just as important when Jesus ministered as his preaching about it. Uh, there's another minister, well-known gentleman named John Wimber wrote, and John Wimber wrote, Proclamation of a faulty gospel will produce faulty or at best weak Christians, such as the case all too often today. So if we leave the reality of the preaching of the kingdom and the demonstration of the kingdom out of the gospel, um, we're preaching a faulty gospel. Okay? And not only are we preaching a faulty gospel, we're producing weak Christians in the church. Without incorporating the aspects of healing and deliverance into the foundation of the ministry of the church and its practices, believers will suffer, people will remain sick and bound, the spread of the gospel will be hindered, and the kingdom will not advance as Jesus intended. In the places in the world right now where you see Christianity really spreading at an unprecedented rate, um, those are areas where... Uh, the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. Those are areas where signs, wonders, and miracles are happening. So not only is this available to the present-day church, all believers, all believers, that includes you guys, if you are a believer, you've been com commissioned and commanded by Scripture, by Jesus, by the apostles, that you are to move in the ministry of physical healing. Now, let's talk about this. These aren't, these aren't just my opinions, okay? Uh, these are, and I wanna, the whole po point of this teaching is to lay down a foundation, a scriptural, biblical foundation for physical healing. So if somebody says to you today, well, I don't know that the Bible teaches that. You're, you're equipped by scripture. You know what the Bible says about this, okay? So first of all, I want to talk about God's nature as a healer, okay? And, you know, when, when you look at the Bible, it's important to remember that a lot of times there are many names of God in Scripture. And those names, especially in Scripture, names pointed to the nature of someone. Now, you know, our, our names don't always point to our personality or our nature, but in Scripture they really were highlighted that. And one of the names of God is Jehovah Rapha, okay? And um, in Exodus 15, 26, the Lord says, I am the Lord who heals you, okay? So that points to the reality. One of the names of God reveal who he is. And so healing is part of the nature of God. Dr. Randy Clark wrote, the name Jehovah Rapha indicates that healing flows out from the very nature of God. It is God's heart to heal because that is who He is. You cannot separate 
healing from God. And you cannot separate who he is from what he does. Because it's his nature, it's who he is, he wants to do that. Okay. Um, now, this same nature is reflected in Jesus. And we understand that Jesus was God in the flesh. He came from God the Father. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus. If you want to see the will of God in action, look at Jesus. Okay? He came to demonstrate God. He came to reveal who God was and who God is. And um, Bill Johnson, many of you have heard of Bill Johnson, uh, famous pastor and leader out of Bethel Church. Uh, Jesus, he said, Jesus reflected perfect theology both in what he showed us of the Father and what he showed us about carrying out the Father's will. Okay? And any time Jesus was confronted with someone who was sick, he healed them. And there's one account of a blind man that comes to Jesus and he said, you know, Jesus, if you're willing, you can heal me. And, and he said, I'm willing. Or the leper said, Jesus, if you're willing, you can cleanse me. And he said, I'm willing. So the same God who declared he was Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer, he became flesh and dwelt among us as Jesus, God in physical form, healing the sick, casting out demons, and raising the dead. Another thing that we can understand from Scripture in the Old Testament is that Jesus understood that he was the Messiah and that his healing ministry would prove this reality. We know that there were many, many, many scriptures about Messiah, what he would do, what, what he would be like when he actually came. Multiple, multiple scriptures from different writers in the Old Testament, and Jesus fulfilled all of those scriptures. Now, one of those was that there was, there were, the Messiah would come, and there were certain things that he would do that would prove he was the Messiah. And we see that uh, one of these passages is in Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 6. It says, Your God will come. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then, he, then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. So we see in this passage that certain things are highlighted, like the blinds, blind are going to see, deaf ears are going to open up, those who are lame, those who can't walk, they'll leap like a deer, and those who can't talk, suddenly they'll be able to shout for joy. Okay? And so as Jesus began his ministry, he quoted this verse about himself, indicating that this scripture was filled, fulfilled through him. So here comes Jesus and here's the funny thing. Jesus grew up. Everybody knew who he was. They'd all grown up with him. They knew that he was Joseph's son. And one day he starts ministering and preaching in the synagogue, which is where the Jews, it was like the Jews' church. Okay? And he gathers and he comes to the front and he reads this passage of Scripture about himself. And it says, this Scripture is fulfilled in me. That's a really, really bold statement. And this is what he said. He quoted Isaiah 61. He said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. It's really bold that he did that, but he knew who he was. He knew what Scripture said about himself and that he was to fulfill this. Dr. Randy Clark wrote, At the outset of his ministry, Jesus announced in the synagogue in Nazareth that he came as a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 61 about the coming Messiah. The prophecy included healing the brokenhearted, giving sight to the blind, setting at liberty those who are oppressed, and, uh, and Messiah was to have a healing ministry. It was a big part of of the prophetic things that were said about Messiah when he came. So Jesus, he, he's not only moving in the nature of God, he's fulfilling prophetic promises about Messiah by healing the sick and doing miracles. Okay? This is one thing that proves he's Messiah, the Son of God, 
that he's doing these miraculous things. Now, one of the things that often happens when we start talking about healing ministry is you, you run into the thing that people ask, well, does God really want to heal everything? Or are there only certain things that he wants to heal? Can God heal terminal illness? Can he, can he heal chronic diseases? Can he heal mental illness? Okay, or, 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 or does he just do headaches and stomach aches? Okay. No, you know, so we're going to look at what Scripture says about that. Now, the extent of God and through Jesus as well, Jesus' willingness to heal can be seen in Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. And this is what King David wrote. He said, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Okay? So even in the Old Testament, David wrote, you know, not only does God uh, forgive all your sins, and those of us that grew up in the church, we hear that over and over. God will, heal, will forgive all sins. We're pretty good with that, even though sometimes in the middle of our sin, we're like, God, can you really forgive us of this? But he does, he can. But this same verse says that God heals all your diseases. And some of us struggle with that a little bit more. But we're going to talk about that. So Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5, okay, indicates that in addition to spiritual healing, Messiah would pay the price for physical and emotional healing as well. So we're going to read this scripture in a minute. But keep in mind, a lot of times when people read Isaiah 53, um, they, they think things like, um, well, this just is talking about that we're saved, that we can get saved, that God spiritually heals us, and, but he's not interested in our physical conditions. Okay. Well, let's just, I want to read that out of Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. And, you know, as we're approaching um, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, Passover, whatever your tradition is in the next weeks, you're going to hear this verse, these verses a lot. And again, these are, are prophetic things writing about what Messiah would do when he came. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, Isaiah wrote this as a prophetic writing about what Jesus would fulfill. It's pretty amazing stuff. It says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him, him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, and some translations say by his stripes... We are healed. Okay, now big part of this verse it talks about that, you know, for our transgressions, for our iniquities, for our sins, Jesus Messiah is going to take all those things. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crushed, and all this is coming upon him. And he's doing it so that salvation can come to all people. And so people say, well, these passages just there. That's just about salvation. That's just about spiritual healing. That's just about forgiveness of sins. But if you pay attention, what, you know, one of the best things that you can do to interpret Scripture is look at other Scriptures. Okay? And so uh, in discussing this Scripture, Dr. Randy Clark wrote, and he's, giving a, he's showing that there's how this is literally translated from the Hebrew. It says, Surely he took up our infirmities. Okay? which means sickness. Infirmity is sickness. It's saying in the Old Testament Scripture that Messiah not only took our sin, but He took up our sickness. It says He carried our sorrows. Okay? Sorrow, the translation from that in the original Hebrew language, it literally means He took our pains. Anybody ever have pain that you need Jesus to take? Not just emotional, but physical it says, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Okay? So this is pointing not only to forgiveness of sins and cleansing us, forgiving us, and 
giving us a new nature in Christ, but it talks about that literally our sicknesses, our pains, our diseases, we're actually healed because of what Jesus did on the cross. And we'll talk about this more. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew quotes in the New Testament, talking about he saw Jesus' life and he wrote about it, and he's referencing Isaiah 53, okay? But he references this in the context. What he writes about Jesus is that Jesus is healing the sick and setting people free from demons, okay? And then he quotes, uh, he quotes Isaiah 53 in the middle of this. This is what Matthew wrote. He wrote this in, in Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. It said, When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was, was, was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. So Matthew writes about this. He's watching what Jesus is doing. He's alive when Jesus is doing all these things. And he's like, oh, yeah. And Matthew was a Jew. So he knows the Old Testament. And he looks back at the Old Testament. And he said, this scripture about Messiah, Jesus is doing it. And he's doing it. He's fulfilling it by healing the sick and casting out demons. Okay, So it's very interesting. So Matthew quotes it not in the context of people getting saved and getting forgiven of their sins, but in the context of Jesus healing diseases, healing sickness, and casting out demons. And Jesus cast out demons as much as he healed the sick. Okay, It was a big, big part of what he did. These passages and others strongly indicate that Jesus' ministry and sacrifice were more were for more than spiritual healing and salvation. Now, spiritual healing and salvation, they're included in these passages. But it also extends to the realm of physical, mental, and emotional healing as well. About a year ago, it's been a little over a year, about a year ago, January in 2018, um, we had a, a, a lady here in the church who was ministering. And she'll actually be back in May, and she's going to minister to you guys her name's Joe Moody, and uh, there was a lady in the church who had broken a bone in her in her, in her foot, an elderly lady, and uh, Joe called this lady up. Many of you know this lady, Miss Betty, and she had her her walking boot cast on, and uh, Joe prayed for her, and she said, "Now, I want you to take off your boot and test it. Okay, now don't do this." unless you have your parents' permission, right? And uh, so Betty was really scared. All her kids were scared. I was scared because I'm like, we've got this old woman, and you're wanting her to take off her cast and walk around. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what if <laughs> she's not healed? What if she breaks her foot worse? What if she falls in the floor and rolls around? That's going to be terrible. Nobody wants to see that happen in a service. Well, Miss Betty talk her, took her boot off, and she started walking around. Her foot wasn't broken anymore. And in case you're like, well, I don't know about that. She went back to the doctor, because if it's a real miracle, don't be afraid to let a doctor see it. Okay? And she goes to the doctor. He x-rays her. There's new bone growing. And he told her, he said, you need to go buy a lottery ticket because you are one lucky woman. He couldn't explain it, but her bone was healed and medically verified that it was no longer broken. Okay, Is that awesome? I think that's really, really awesome when God not only does a miracle, but it can be medically confirmed. Okay, And I'll talk about another one of those in a minute that happened in this school a few years ago. So... Now let's talk a little bit more. We know that, that Jesus did these things, that he wants to heal all sickness and disease, infirmity, but sometimes we're like, well, but Jesus did that. The early church did that, but that doesn't happen anymore. Okay, so let's talk about this. Now, the basis of physical healing comes through three basic principles. 
okay, or we're taking notes, this would be a great time to write this. Physical healing comes through three biblical principles. It comes through the covenant, the atonement, and the kingdom. I'll say this again. Physical healing comes through three biblical principles. The covenant, the atonement, and the kingdom. Okay? And we're going to look at each one of these. Now, covenant is, is, is an agreement. Okay? And in, in Bible times, an agreement was when you make a covenant, it was hardcore important. I mean, you, it was very serious. You couldn't break a covenant without serious consequences. The closest thing that we have to covenants today is if you get married, that's a covenant. Now, unfortunately, today a lot of people break those very easily. Or you, you buy a house or you have a business agreement. Those are all covenants. But in the Old Testament, you did things like, you know, it was crazy. You would kill an animal and sacrifice it and as a, a, a proof that you'd made covenant together. So God is a God of covenant. We're living under a new covenant right now. And I'm really thankful. And healing has always been a part of a covenant with His people. Now, I want to read an Old Testament scripture because healing didn't just come when Jesus came. God's always had a covenant with people who followed Him, a covenant of healing. In Exodus 34.10... Read this verse. It says, The Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Now, this is the covenant that God made with the Jewish nation, with the Israelites, with his people. He said, Before all the people, I will do wonders never before done in any other nation in all the world. The people, will, the people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. So God basically said, hey, you, you're who are my people. You're then in covenant with me as my covenant people. I'm going to do such incredible things through you that all the nations that live around you that aren't part of my covenant, they're going to see that you're my people and that I'm God because of what I do through you. That's really, really powerful. Dr. Randy Clark wrote, signs and wonders were, a, were to be a part of the establishment of that covenant. God did wonderful things in the bodies of the people. Healing and deliverance are included in signs and wonders. The Bible even says that if we obey this covenant that he established, then we will not have the sicknesses that were put on the people of Egypt. God said, hey, I'm going to make this covenant with you. And I'm going to show my signs and wonders. And I'm going to deliver you out of bondage. And there's going to be some judgments that come against the Egyptians, but that's not going to happen to you. The Bible even talks about that even when darkness was on the land of Egypt, it said it was so dark that you could feel it. Couldn't see anything. But it said in the children of Israel, in their, in their dwelling places, there was light. God did miraculous things. He took them into the wilderness, taking them to the promised land. They didn't get sick. Their clothing didn't wear out. He supernaturally provided food. It's just crazy. Even when they disobeyed him, he still met their needs. And, uh, and he, dis he said, because he had a covenant of signs and wonders and healing with a Jewish race. So uh, this covenant established is also established in the New Testament through the shedding of Jesus' blood, and it makes provision for both forgiveness of sin and healing of disease. Now, the really exciting thing is we're in the New Covenant because of what Jesus did. Jesus, in the Old Covenant... You know, they would, they would kill a, a goat or something or a lamb to make a covenant. Well, in the new covenant, it was the blood of Jesus that was spilled on Passover, <laughs> on the cross, that established a new covenant with us. And it purchased forgiveness of sins, but it also purchased healing of all diseases. Dr. Randy Clark wrote, the book of Hebrews says that we have a better covenant based upon a better sacrifice. I know healing is in the new covenant. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, I know its power is not only available to cover our sins, 
but also for grace that enables us to have victory over diseases. So we have a better covenant. You guys remember watching the Prince of Egypt and the things that God did? You guys, we watched that in school. Did you know that that is an, a, a covenant that is not as good as the covenant we have today? Did you know that God's covenant for signs, wonders, and miracles is more powerful to, today than it was in that time because of the blood of Jesus? So healing is not a new provision in the new covenant, but has always been God's desire. So that's the first one. God's a God of covenant. Healing comes through covenant. Now, the second one is the atonement. The provision of healing is best demonstrated through the atonement, which we previously read about in Isaiah 53. So Jesus' atoning sacrifice, we, we get that as Christians. We're like, yeah, you know, we celebrate... Jesus' atonement, um, and we celebrate that we've been forgiven of sins, okay? Um, but Jesus' atoning sacrifice made provision for physical healing as well, okay? 1 Peter 2.24, He Himself bore our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. So Peter requotes that. He said, you know, you're, Jesus bore your sins, and by his stripes you're healed. Dr. Randy Clark wrote, In Christ's atonement, God has provided for many blessings for the world he loves. Do you know God loves the world? And that's why Jesus made an atoning sacrifice, because God's love for the world is so great. God doesn't hate the world. He loves the world, and he's made every provision Dr. Clark wrote, The atonement affords freedom from every bondage Satan can muster. Freedom from bondage to sickness, disease, and emotional illness. So the devil wants to, the devil wants to destroy people with sickness, with disease, with sin, with torment. But God has made every provision through the blood of Jesus to break the power of that. However, just as forgiveness of sins is available to all, it must be proclaimed by the people of God and received by those desiring God's free gift. Physical healing is the same. Okay? Physical healing, even though Jesus purchased it, it doesn't happen automatically. Okay? Just like Jesus died, shed his blood, that everybody could be saved. But not everyone says, Lord, I, I take that sacrifice. I receive that because... Just because it's given, you still have to receive it. You still have to receive what Jesus has done and follow him. It's the same way with physical healing. Just because um, it's available doesn't mean that people, first of all, many people don't even believe it. Secondly, they don't pursue it. We have to pursue physical healing. Amen. So, second one is covenant. All right. Now, here's the third one. The reality of the kingdom of God. Okay. So Jesus' teaching included a relatively, relatively new understanding that God's kingdom was at hand through his coming. So George Eldon Ladd, who's this well-known theologian, he wrote, There is a twofold dualism in the New Testament. God's will is done in heaven, and God, the kingdom brings it to earth. You guys, we know the Lord's Prayer. Right? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what brings the kingdom of God to earth? What brings God's will to earth? There are a lot of things that happen in the earth that aren't God's will. Now, part of it is we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let earth be like heaven. Do you know we're supposed to pray that? But Jesus, by coming into the earth, he brought the kingdom. And he said, okay, the kingdom of God is at hand because I'm here. Now you, I'm giving you as my followers, I'm giving you the kingdom. You have to bring it into the earth, into the earth realm. If we want to see the earth changed, we have a responsibility as his followers to bring the kingdom to earth. So Jesus, God's kingdom came into the earth in a new and greater dimension through Jesus' life in ministry. So the kingdom is present and growing 
But it's also, it's now, it's here, but it's not entirely here. It's now, it's not yet. Okay? So how do we get the kingdom here? We preach, proclaim, demonstrate, obey, pray. Because if we want the kingdom to come, we have to take what Jesus did, live in it, proclaim it, and demonstrate it to everyone. So, believers in this age, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, you have the commission and the responsibility to see God's kingdom come. And one of the primary expressions of this mission is through the ministry of physical healing. So if you want to see the kingdom come, you know what? You start living like Jesus and preaching like Jesus and doing the things that Jesus did. Problem is, many believers are like, well, we just want to leave. We just want to get out of here. We just want to go to heaven. We want to be raptured out of here. And that's not what Jesus emphasized. Jesus didn't do that at all. What he emphasized was that the kingdom has to come on the earth. And he's looking for people who will bring the kingdom and demonstrate it and see real change. And one of the greatest ways we can see the kingdom come is start praying for physical healing. Now, there's also a kingdom reality that comes with this understanding that we as the followers of Jesus are in a war. There's a war on the earth right now uh, between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness. Now, if you read through the Bible, it's really no contest. Ultimately, Satan and those who, the, his demons, they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire for eternity. It's a pretty grim future. Satan, the Bible says Satan knows that he's a defeated foe. However, he's warring against what God's trying to release in the earth. There, there are conflicts in the earth right now. Okay? There are conflicts because Satan's like, I don't want the kingdom of God to come, so I'm going to oppose it. I'm going to deceive people. And just like God wants to use people to see his kingdom come, the enemy, Satan, wants to use people to see his kingdom come. Right? Uh, but the blood of Jesus is far greater than that. To see the manifestation of physical healing means it must be accompanied by faith and pursuit to see what is available in the kingdom of God to fully come and dislodge the works of Satan. Okay? So if the, if the works of Satan are to be dislodged, we have to actively pursue what God has given us. If you've been given something, um, but you, you hide it, you lock it away, you lock it up in your black back closet and you never use it, are you wasting what you've been given and you're not walking in it? But if you take what God has given and you start walking in it, you start releasing it, it brings great change. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, for this purpose... The Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. You know why Jesus came? To destroy the works of the devil. And that includes sin, sickness, disease. And you know what, you know what He's wanting to do through you today? Is to destroy the works of the devil. Randy Clark wrote, Jesus saw this conflict as an active one. He saw Himself as carrying the message that God's kingdom is here and now. And then he demonstrated that the kingdom was at hand by healing the sick and casting out demons. So Jesus comes and he says, guess what? God's kingdom is here. It's not just for the future. It's here. And it's here through me. And he didn't just preach it. He said, and to prove it, I'm going to heal the sick and I'm going to cast out demons that are keeping people, people not only held in sickness but in bondage, disease, and addiction. And he's still wanting to do that today through his church, through his people, through those...